There is nothing to begrudge the report on in terms of whether or not what they have stated accurately reflects what is happening on the ground. I've heard people raise concerns about the choice of language. And as you have rightly uh, indicated, when it comes to international human rights issues, when we talk about the state, it's not as though we are referencing the president or the ministers and so on and so forth. We are talking about state actors, the police, the, the military, the intelligence agencies, and so on and so forth. And so when you look at the report and it states that there are reports that the, 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 the government or government actors, you know, perpetrated certain crimes, of course, if it is the police, if it is the military, if it is the National Security Bureau, these are institutions of state. And therefore, whatever actions they take, if it's good, it reflects on the state. If it is bad, it reflects on the state. The other point that I would want to say is that if you read the UN Human Rights Council reports, you would find that in terms of international human rights reporting, there are particular expressions that are used. And these are almost like codified language in terms of international human rights reporting. So for example, when we do uh, country reports on the universal peer review mechanism, which is something that um, you know, countries are obliged to commit to and then uh, periodically submit reports on what has been done. If you submit an NGO report, for example, in terms of editing, they will tell you, no, this cannot pass, you know, this cannot pass, not because the word you have used does not have the meaning that they want to ascribe to it, but there is international language for human rights reporting. And therefore, in terms of what people see and say, well, you see it and you get scared and so on and so forth. For me, what is important is, does it accurately reflect what happens on the ground? And I would say yes. Now, the other point is why the report is of value. Some say if you have been following our work, in the last um, two, three weeks, the government of Guinea-Bissau shut down some 79 radio stations on the basis of defaulting in, their, in the payment of their um, what happened in Ghana authorization fees. And we needed to engage with the government. One of the things we did was to mobilize our partners across the region to get them signed on a petition to demand that the government should listen. And when that petition went, subsequently, my colleagues on the ground in Guinea-Bissau, together with our partners on the ground, mobilized and engaged with the government. Sometimes you need these international voices to be able to make the impact. And that is why sometimes we sit here as Media Foundation for West Africa, and yet we sign on documents to advocate on press freedom issues in Afghanistan. Because the global mobilization of voices then brings a certain perspective to the government that, look, it is not just people here who are listening or who are watching. The world is watching us, and we must listen to that. So for me, it's, it's, a, it's a report of value. Uh, the last time I was on a network with Professor uh, Enin, I think his point was that he doesn't see any value uh, in the report. And the point I made was, look, we are discussing these matters because it has been captured in a US report. We had reported the incidents, all the incidents that had happened on press freedom, the attacks by national security, attacks by police, you know, the closure of radio stations, the politically motivated closure of closure of radio stations, the president's own, you know, statements about whether Suarez murder should be considered an act of press freedom violation or not, the impunity over these crimes, the Kennedy Japan incidents. We have reported on all these. You know, but it takes a US report to come in and then we revisit the conversation and give it, gives it a, a, give, giving it some national you know, appeal and national importance. And so for me, when it comes to human rights, of course, earlier we talked about the, our democracy. We cannot have democracy without you know, uh, Basile, emphasis are you, on are human you, rights. Are you not concerned that this report as you, when you go to their page and you, you go to look for it, it is country, they do various countries. So this is the image that has been given to our country, to the globe, through this report, which is supposed to be accessed by 
anybody in the world. How does it feel? Look, for me, like I said, if it was an exact, I mean, a report that doesn't really cover the events that happen on the ground. And sometimes there are reports that you read from some of these international uh, big countries and you're like, okay, they already have something against China or Russia or, or Iran. And therefore, it may not be surprising that you find this or there. But, but I'm saying that whether it's the press freedom issues, for example, you see internet censorship and they say there were no evidence of um, you know, restrictions on the internet. Inter and then you read it and they say, well, the government uh, takes the, the, the decisions of the court quite seriously. So there are positive elements in there. Oh. You would read in some countries where they would, talk, they would tell you, look, the government arbitrarily shut down the internet occasionally. There were restrictions. The government spied on you know, people using um, mobile phones oh. and so on and so forth. So there are positive elements. Oh. For me, what is important is these matters that have been captured, did they happen? The murder of Kaka, it happened. The attacks on journalists, it happened. The prison conditions, and you have been waging, having a campaign on, on the, the you know, horrible prison conditions. These are matters that exist. Mm. We need to acknowledge these issues and see how we work well, on them. Well